Good morning, Berkeley First. Welcome to Berkeley First. I am Sue Myers, and whether you are black, white, Asian, or Hispanic, rich or poor, LGBTQ plus or straight, a hunter or a vegan, you are welcome here. We gather, we exist to gather, nurture, and equip disciples of Jesus Christ for ministry and mission in the world. If you're seated near the center aisle, <clears throat> please fill out the red sign-in pad, pass it down your row, and once it makes, it way to the, makes its way to the wall, pass it back, leave it open when you pass it back, and learn the names of those seated near you. The United Methodist Women in Faith warmly welcome you to our spring tea luncheon at Berkeley First Campus on Saturday, May 11th, from 11.30 to 2 p.m. It's a perfect occasion to honor the arrival of spring and celebrate mothers and all women. Come with your mother or bring a friend to enjoy a lovely lunch and engaging program at our tables. While the event is free, we, kindly, we ask kindly that you register in advance via the church website to ensure your spot. Let's gather together for a delightful time of fellowship and celebration. Mark your calendars for the all church camp out. The Dunlaps and the Whites have booked from have sites booked from Wednesday, August 7th through Monday, August 12th. Book your own sites at the Portage Lake Campground of Waterloo Recreation Area using the Michigan DNR website. Even if you plan to stay Saturday and Sunday, we recommend booking your site through Monday to have full use to have Full, have yet use of the day all day Sunday. Can't make it for the weekend? Day trip it, park at one of our campsites, and enjoy Sunday morning worship out in nature with time to relax at the beach all afternoon. Berkeley First will have outdoor worship at the camp out as well as our regular service in Berkeley at 10 a.m. that weekend. Get in touch with Zach if you have questions. More info about all groups, events, and activities is available at berkeleyfirst.org. Also on the church website, you'll find a place to set up one-time or recurring gifts, financial gifts to support our shared work together. If you have a check or cash you'd like to give to support our mission and ministry, the donation box is available in the back. As we turn our hearts to worship, let's pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you for this beautiful day, the sunshine and blue sky and the wonderful spring weather we had most of this week. And we give, also give thank, even give thanks for the rain because it cleanses the earth and nourishes new growth. Lord, we give thanks for all the wonders of your creation. And as we go forward into another week, and the busyness of our lives. Let us be mindful and appreciative of the beauty all around us and that it came from you. And may we remember that like the spring flowers and buds on the trees, we are born anew in Christ. Today, I lift up our prayers, both spoken and unspoken, confident that you know what is in our hearts. Lord, I pray that we continue to carry with us the joy of Easter Sunday, living in gladness and hope, and sharing the love we have so generously received with others. In the name of your precious Son, Jesus. Amen. Beautiful day. At this time, uh, we're going to start worshiping. If you're willing and able, please stand and join us.
the same old road for miles and miles. And you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you've been trying to fill the same old holes inside, then there's a better life. And there's a better life. If you got pain, it's a pain taker. You feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, a saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. And we've all searched for the light of day in the day. Worn out from the same old fight. And we've all run to things that we know just ain't right. And there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel Today's scripture is from 2 Timothy, chapter, or chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. Amen, amen. Jesus' death and resurrection literally changed the world. And well, resurrection is a historic event of the most epic proportions, it is also present reality and future hope. Jesus' upraising set something in motion for all who believe, wherever and whoever they may be. 
Forty days after his resurrection, Jesus gathered with 11 of his closest followers on a Galilean hillside, instructing them to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. You and I are here today because of their work. As of March this year, nearly 2.4 billion people around the globe claim to follow Jesus, around 31% of the world's population. Christianity is the most international faith tradition, and while it began in the Middle East, most adherents today hail from the Americas, Europe, and Sub-Saharan Africa, with a growing number of Asia-Pacific Christians. The call to go and make disciples has compelled Christians to circumnavigate the globe multiple times over in every direction, establishing churches, yes, but also hospitals, schools, children's homes, and senior care centers. All children are God's children. And while last week we discussed what it looks like to raise up children to know, love, and serve God in this world, today we're talking about raising up disciples, which begs the question, what exactly is a disciple? Go ahead and turn to someone sitting near you and share with them, there are no wrong answers here, what you think a disciple is in the Christian sense of the term. Go ahead and take a minute. There are probably as many possible answers to that question as there are people worshiping with us today, online and in person. But most of those answers have points of overlap. Um, Jody here was saying that a, a disciple is a disciplined follower of Jesus. And perhaps a working definition could be something like this. A disciple is someone who knows Jesus, loves Jesus, and walks in the way of Jesus. Discipleship involves both belief and action. It's deeply personal, but also has an impact on how we live in the world. Jesus is Savior, Lord, Messiah, and King. He's also a rabbi, a teacher. And in the Jewish tradition, there's an old blessing for someone who's a disciple, who's studying under and following after a rabbi. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. That is, may you follow your rabbi, your teacher, so closely, so intimately, that the dust they kick up as they walk along the road covers you head to toe. Being a disciple is about following Jesus that closely. Disciples are not born. They are called, crafted, and deployed. Make no mistake, if you are not already a disciple, if you are not already following after Jesus, Jesus is following after you. God knows you better than you know yourself, your hopes, your struggles, your joys, your shortcomings, and he calls to you, come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. Come, follow me, and I will give you life to the full. Follow me, and you will thirst no more. You'll find what is truly satisfying to body, mind, and soul. Again, Jesus says, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. God calls to you. And if you respond to that call with a yes, 
If you wake up from your slumber, get up from where you've been and walk in step with Jesus, you will begin to be crafted. Many of you are on that journey, most of you, and and you know that God will shape you from the inside out, fashioning you to be the best version of yourself, crafting you into an instrument of peace, joy, hope, and love. God not only crafts us Himself, God has also given us one another to sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron or as a diamond is the only thing that can cut a diamond. We bump up against one another, sharpen one another, build up beautifully designed facets in one another so that we can better reflect the light of Christ to the world around us. I pray that you are covered in the dust of your rabbi Jesus. But I also have to ask, in addition to Christ, whose dust covers you? Who is mentoring you, training you? If the answer is no one, then reach out. I'd love to meet with you personally or put you in touch with a person or group of people within this church who can help you grow in your faith. Discipleship involves walking with Jesus, but not only with Jesus. We walk with him together and learn from one another along the journey. My grandpa Dunlap used to say, find someone who does something with excellence and you watch them. I don't care if it's a window washer. Watch them and learn. Disciples are called Disciples are crafted, and then disciples are deployed. With this in mind, let's examine the mentoring relationship between the original writer and recipient of today's scripture passage. Second Timothy is likely the final letter that Paul wrote, and he penned it to his mentee, Timothy. These early church leaders shared a special bond not unlike parent and child. And when Paul knew that his death was imminent, he encouraged his spiritual son, Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. There are four generations in that statement. Paul here is first generation, and he's instructing Timothy, second generation, to entrust the message of Jesus to reliable people, third generation, who will then, fourth generation, be able to teach others. I saw this at work last year among our missionary partners in Cuba as pastors Miguel and Mercedes brought our team to worship with their spiritual mentor, and then to worship with their spiritual mentee. As Pastor Miguel held his spiritual mentee's child in his arms, his face just radiated joy, and I saw in that moment that the four-generation cycle was complete. I told the church in Cuba that day of the leadership development I had witnessed there, the way that I had seen Scripture fulfilled, and that God wants the same for each of our families each of our children, each of our neighbors. It doesn't stop at the fourth generation, though. It multiplies and spreads. That's why the Christian movement has expanded from a couple of handfuls of followers on a Galilean hillside to over two billion people around the world. And do you know where one of the fastest growing mission fields is? Right Here, in the U.S. of A., your own backyard, where people are growing up today who have not yet seriously considered a relationship with Jesus Christ. What a time to be alive. We have work to do, friends. The things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. We've seen that fulfilled here at Berkeley First. 
as congregants have become preachers and students have become teachers. We have multiple people from this church that are going to seminary in the fall. That's the way it's supposed to be. So friends, who are you mentoring? Who are you raising up? And on the opposite side of that, who is mentoring you? I had a great conversation with George Work earlier this week. We're so committed to discipleship, we actually have a committee on discipleship. And George is the chair of our discipleship committee. He and Julie are out of town, but worshiping with us online today. Hey, guys. And he wanted me to hammer home that there are really four aspects to discipleship. The first is one-on-one time with God. If discipleship is ultimately about knowing Jesus, loving Jesus, and walking in the way of Jesus, then cultivating that relationship is of the utmost importance. Even for those who are super involved in church life, we can sometimes get so busy doing things for God that we neglect to spend one-on-one time with God. God. Revelation chapter 2 is written to the church in Ephesus saying, you have forsaken the love you had at first. If you are a Christian, don't get so busy doing the stuff of ministry that you fail to tend to your most important relationship, the one you have with God in Jesus Christ. Pray. Talk with God about your day. Open up the Bible and read God's Word for you. Or download the YouVersion Bible app and use that if you're not used to handling much printed matter these days. The second aspect of discipleship is participating in worship. Having one-on-one time with God is essential, but in Genesis, when Adam walked in perfect relationship with God, God still said, it is not good for the man to be alone. We need one another. And in worship, while the focus is on God, it's also about our lives lived in community. Worship reminds us that Christianity is bigger than your own personal relationship with God. God is also in relationship with all of us, calling us forward, creating new hearts and minds within us, and equipping us for what God has in store. Worship helps anchor us in Christian community. But if you really want to go deep in your discipleship, worship will only take you so far. That's why engaging in a small group is also an aspect of discipleship. Small groups are the context where we can really get to know one another beyond a smile and a handshake. They open up spaces of honesty, truth, and vulnerability, which may understandably feel a bit uncomfortable, but are essential to the process of discipleship. In small groups, we laugh together, grieve together, pray for one another, and encourage one another. We examine Scripture together, share about what God is doing in our lives, and at times hold one another accountable. Birmingham and Berkeley First has a whole host of small groups, and I encourage you to find the one that's right for you. Later this year, we'll be starting up even more groups in an effort to provide space for everyone to get involved. A new seven-week group will be right here Thursday evenings starting May 9th. Open to people of all ages and genders, this group will focus on the fact that God's plans are meant for good. We are meant for good. And what happens to us is meant to go through us and out to others. That leads to our fourth aspect of discipleship, helping and sharing with others. While Christianity is certainly about inward transformation, it is also about outward participation. What happens in here should shape what goes on out here. And what happens in here in the church should shape what goes on out there in the world. Disciples are always learning, but they're also always leading. 
Our personal knowledge of God and love of God compels us to reach out in concern and service to the world around us, working to dismantle systems of injustice and oppression, raising up those experiencing poverty, and sharing with others what God has done for us in the hopes that they too will hear the call of Christ on their lives. Discipleship is not only vital to your faith, it's also vital to the faith community and the wider world. When we make it only about ourselves, we can become spiritually inflated while making little or no external impact. On the other hand, if we neglect our first love and fail to take that one-on-one -on -one time with God, our discipleship can become outwardly performative while inwardly we are wasting away. Discipleship begins with acknowledging that God loves you and wants what is truly best for you. When fear kicks in, we can sometimes dismiss or bash God's loving outreach toward us. But when we choose to trust, when we answer that call, God's work begins. And ultimately, discipleship is not about our striving, but about God's work in us. You and I have the power to plant and water. It's God who makes things grow. But our part is still essential. Tend the soil of your heart and community so as to make it fertile ground for God's work. After UConn's victory over USC in the NCAA Elite Eight, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's sportsing related, college basketball player Paige Beckers put it simply, I did all I could so God can do all I can't. Now, in that game alone that she was being interviewed after, she had 28 points, 10 rebounds, and 6 assists. She put in the hard work to get to that and then left the rest in God's hands. Back when I was in school, I studied, I paid attention, and whenever test day came around, I'd pray something like this. God, I did what I could to prepare for this. I might not have done all that I could, but I did what I could, and I leave the rest up to you. Help me recall that which I have learned and to guess well on the stuff that I didn't. God is all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful. But God chooses to work through you and me. Make no mistake, there's a cost to discipleship. It takes determination and self-discipline. And as the author of Hebrews puts it, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. It's fun being a slacker basketball player, except on game day. If you want to perform well, you have to train well. The same is true in our spiritual lives. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Discipleship is not confined to a particular place and time. It's an everyday activity of growing in God's grace, meeting God in personal prayer and devotion, doing life in community with Jesus' followers, and together making an impact in this world. If you know what your core values are, and you find a group of people who can help you live into those values, people with similar values themselves, people who also have felt the call of God on their lives, now you've really got something. 
Back to our scripture from 2 Timothy for just a moment, and I'll leave you with this. Paul's charge to Timothy in his dying days was to pass on what he had learned and experienced of Jesus Christ to the third and fourth generation. Jesus' call, his final instruction to his disciples on this earth was to go and make disciples. Here's my question for you. Can someone truly be a disciple of Jesus without having a hand in making more disciples? We are called to multiply, called to raise up disciples, gathered to be scattered and deployed so that in every corner and crevice of this earth, people can know someone personally who knows, loves, and walks in the way of Jesus. I'm willing to believe that you are that person for someone, for people in your neighborhood, your workplace, your family. How you live your faith in the world and whether or not you invite them to join you in the journey is of no small consequence. It's a matter of faithfulness to God's call, something of eternal significance, and quite frankly, it's God's one and only plan to transform the world. So church, let us gather, nurture, and equip disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. The night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread. And having blessed that bread and given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. When supper was over, Jesus took the cup. And after giving thanks to the Father, he gave it to his disciples And said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it as often as you do and remember me. As we prepare to approach the communion table, let's pray. I'll open us up and then I invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. The words will be up on the screen when the time comes. Good and loving God. You have pursued us. You have called us. You have brought us to this moment and to this season of our lives. We know that you who have been with us through all we have experienced thus far will continue to be with us in all that is yet to come, even if we don't see the path fully illuminated before us. God, we pray that you would help us to be better disciples ourselves to follow you more closely, to be covered in the dust of our rabbi. We also pray, God, that you would empower us to make disciples, to go into all the world, the corners and crevices of our, of our neighborhoods and our workplaces, God, and to shine the light and love of your son, Jesus Christ, in a way that compels others to ask about the hope we have in you. God, we pray that you would pour out your spirit on us who are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. May they be for us so much more than bread and juice. May they be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, that as we remember his sacrifice, his death and his resurrection, we might find the power to live resurrected lives ourselves to keep in step with you and to help others do the same. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus who lived for us, died for us, rose for our sakes, and who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I invite those who are going to help me serve communion to come forward at this time. Absolutely everyone is welcome at God's family table. You don't have to be a member of this church or any church. If you want to draw near to God, know that it is God's greatest desire to be close to you. And here at Berkeley First, each and every Sunday, it's the kids who lead the way to God's family table. If you're worshiping with us online, go ahead and get something to eat and something to drink so that you too may table with us. And if you're here in person in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to come forward down the center aisle, tear a piece off the bread, dip it into the cup, or if you prefer, you may receive the pre-wrapped communion elements and remember what Christ has done for you. Thine eyes cling to. 
to the crucified Jesus the Lamb who died cling to the crucified Jesus the King cling to the crucified Jesus the Lamb who died Jesus Jesus the King, cling to the crucified, Jesus the Lamb who died, cling to the crucified, Jesus the King. As we continue our time of worship, if you're willing and able, please stand and join us. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let a rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burden.
Today is the start of Berkeley's first ever capital campaign. This is a church that truly welcomes all. And it's time for our physical space to fully reflect that reality. In the back, as well as at berkeleyfirst.org slash for all, you'll find information on our plans to renovate are circa 1954 and 1972 restrooms to create individual spaces that are gender neutral and ADA compliant. In short, to create space for all to feel safe, seen, welcomed, and included at Berkeley First. It will cost approximately $200,000 to renovate both the upstairs and downstairs restrooms. And generous donors from this congregation have already committed $30,000 toward this project. Take a brochure from the back or check out the information we have online 
and begin to prayerfully consider how you can help us create space for all. We'll talk more about the Berkeley Capital Campaign in the weeks to come. But for now, go in peace, go in love, go and make disciples.